Warning, the radio broadcast you are about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another week of The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy. So glad you are here. Such an exciting time in our world. Joining you today from the Carolina Catholic Media Network studio on North Tryon Street. We have Mr. Brant back there in the studio running things for us. Thanks for being a part of the show today. Also joining us in-house, my good friend Jim DiPiante. Jim is a follower of the traditional Latin Mass he attends the Society of St. Pius X Chapel in Mount Holly. He's a father of five, 30 years, IBM man, and uh, glad to have you again here with us, Jim. Glad to be here, Jason. Thank you kindly. We, uh, we have been covering a ton of information. We've been talking about the traditional Latin Mass versus the Novus Ordo Mass, some of the uh, items of uh, contention between the two, the differences, very specific differences, Vatican II, and uh, so many other things. Uh, but today, before we get get cranking, a um, few you know topics of interest that might be might be worthwhile. Uh, this week we celebrate the National Day of Prayer. On that same very day, we celebrate the feast of Pope Pius V. Uh, Pope Pius V uh, drew up a bull back in 1570, Quo Primum. Jim, I'm sure you're familiar with that <laughs> yeah. one. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one there. Um, there is quite a bit to it, but I guess the meat of the matter, um, Pope Pius V says, we grant and concede in perpetuity that go. for the chanting or reading of the Mass in any church whatsoever, this missile is hereafter to be followed absolutely, without any scruple of conscience or fear of incurring any penalty, judgment, or censure, and may freely and lawfully be used." And that this present document cannot be revoked or modified, but remain always valid and retain its full force, says saintly Pope Pius V back in 1570. So this was a papal bull. Um, Let's let's talk about real quick the difference between what (laughs) between a papal bull and a moto proprio, which uh, Pope Pope Francis uh, issued last year. Traditionis custodis, I assume you're referring to. Right. So let's talk about a little bit of difference between the two uh, in the the rank of hierarchy of these type of documents. Uh, Papal bull would be considered um, more formal. Okay. Um, And it's called a bull because the the bolo is the uh, the lead seal that's that's put on a document. Uh, So it's it's a matter of formality. it's it's issued by the Pope, so it's a it's a declaration from the Pope, as is a motu proprio. A motu proprio is something that is issued on his own initiative or by his own hand, okay. is is generally what that means. Papal bull is considered um, <clears throat> uh, of of greater formality. Okay. So, in the spirit of the National Day of Prayer, Pope Pius V. Pray for us. Pray for us. All right. pro nobis. So uh, if you're living in this world like I am and, and Jim is and, and Mr. Brandt is out there, um, you're familiar with all of the craziness and, and strange <laughs> things and events in the political it and just doesn't stop, religious does <laughs> realm. And, uh, you know, going from a pandemic to civil unrest to uh, a war in Ukraine with Russia, soaring gas prices, inflation, interest rates, um, you know, just a, a world of confusion. And I hate to even mention, but I just have to, if anybody has watched any portion of this Johnny Depp trial, <laughs> Lord, I think this is, the, this is the spirit child of the world in which we live. I mean, what a mess. I got to say, it's like a train wreck. I've had to glance at it a couple times, and it's just, it's, it's, it's just strange. It's out there. It's weird, but isn't the world we live. The world we live in is, um, yeah, it's iconic. It's, uh, it, yeah. So, I mean, if it couldn't get any weirder, here comes here comes trotting Judge Alito and the Supreme Court justices to throw out there that Roe versus Wade is going to be potentially reversed. 
Yeah. How about that? Well, the, the the worst of it is, why would we know that? Exactly. At this point, yeah, it's 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 unprecedented. I mean, it just doesn't happen that 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 upcoming uh, Supreme Court judgments are leaked, and just before the midterm. So yeah, this is really really problematic. <laughs> yeah. So Politico uh, published this leak. Um, that was written by, you know, Justice Alito and marked as a first draft in the Dobbs versus Jackson women's health case, which he concluded, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled, saying that Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Um, Chief Justice Roberts confirmed Tuesday that the document was authentic, but added that it does not represent a decision by the court or the final position by any member on the issues in the case. So uh, there is an investigation underway for the leak, which we can, you know, we don't want to assume, but, you know, from all intents and purposes, looking at it, probably not good intention there to no, uh, put, no, put some heat. It's nefarious without, without any doubt, you know, which is really a shame. I mean, a lot of people on, in the, um, in the in the various communities, we're all giving each other high fives, and uh, yeah. everybody's all happy. I was like, "Wait, slow down! Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is not a verdict. Yeah, this is, this is not a decision. It's, Talk uh, about stir the pot, <clears throat> right? Um, I mean, that came out of nowhere. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, we wouldn't have known about that without a leak, but but wow! I mean, you know, thanks be to God that that is you know a, a possibility. You know, that the pro life movement has been uh, and fighting this, indicated, yep. you know, and. And such a such a great uh, accomplishment if we can we can get that and um, you know this have this this respect for for life from conception to natural death um, so very very important there um, I've heard tale that there are stacks of bricks being uh, positioned in, in in different locations in Washington that's from a pretty reliable source um, kind of similar to some of the riots that took place in 2020 and 2016. Well, and there's, there's no question and that if uh, if this happens, if it plays out as anticipated, that uh, uh, there will be civil unrest. I'm yeah, sure. it's, all, it's all but been threatened. Well, the, the devil is dancing, uh, and he is he's about to go on full attack here. Um, I just uh, I can I can put in my mind the vision of. Uh, of Satan in the movie The Passion, oh, yeah. when when yeah. whenever our Lord uh, completes the resurrection or completes the salvation story, and and the devil screaming and raving down in hell, and I know with with uh, with 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 the evil that's done to the 63 million innocent uh, victims of of this crime of abortion, um, he is writhing right now, um, and there he will stir uh, he will stir the pot even more. So so we shall pray for for this. Pray for the judge justices especially uh because sure. they are yeah. they are in for the fight of their lives with this this is um this is a grave matter um so anyway we are we're going to jump back in here you know we've been talking about uh the traditional latin mass and we've talked specifically about the society of saint pius the 10th and their role and position in the church and, and you know why they're there and how they got there um we've hinted around you know about its founding with archbishop marcel lefebvre and thought that it would be important and pertinent to maybe jump in and, and learn a little bit about the man himself um you know for in, responsible for such a movement and uh given now now that we've seen with traditiones custodes and the removal of the rights to the traditional latin mass um we're seeing uh, quite a homage being i don't want to say homage pay you know like they're worshiping but i think there's a realization that you know without him and without his work back in 1970 we may not have ever, even ever had this opportunity to um to defend the traditional latin mass right right um, so, Jim, could, you, could just give us a little history, you know, tell us uh, about the start and, you know, what, what uh, Archbishop's uh, role was, you know, when he became a priest, I think, uh, going back to 1929. Right, right. So I would say he was 24, I believe, when he was ordained. I'm pretty sure he was born in 1905. Um, I'd just like to make one general observation. If Marcel Lefebvre were not associated with the traditional Latin Mass, founding the Society of St. Pius X, he would still... I'm sure that that will that will result in his canonization eventually, mm-hmm. but I think he would have been canonized in any case because he was an amazing, amazing man. He went straight from uh, his uh, his education as a as a child and then as a young man into the seminary in France or in uh, in France, yeah, and then to the French seminary in Rome. And he was ordained, and he was uh, very quickly recognized as 
a brilliant man, a good leader, a good organizer, eventually found his way to the Holy Ghost Fathers and uh, became their spirit general in Africa. And I think he had authority over something like 18 provinces and is responsible for for just thousands and thousands and thousands of conversions. Mm -hmm. I actually know a fellow here from North Carolina who was – who is in South Carolina, rather, who is uh, is French, but grew up in, in Dakar. Okay. And <clears throat> was ordained as an infant, or was uh, baptized as an infant by Marcel Lefebvre, oh, wow. which, is, which is kind of pretty cool, by Father Marcel Lefebvre, mm. if you can imagine. Wow. So um, he was marvelously successful as, <clears throat> as a missionary and as the Spirit General of the Holy Ghost Fathers. He was considered uh, the leader of what people characterize as the more conservative uh, element of the fathers that, who went to the Second Vatican Council. He was considered an absolute expert and was highly regarded by, the, by John XXIII. Unfortunately, the, um, the, the traditional faction, if you will, of the, uh, of the Council Fathers was um, overwhelmed by the the German bishop surprise. <laughs> mm, yeah, goes around, um, comes around, and um, and uh, it was the council was a was a terrible disappointment to him, and he began to make no question he he signed the council documents, um, but he had grave reservations about some of them, not all of them by any means. Um, but he ended up speaking against certain of those documents. The Holy Ghost Fathers uh, became unhappy with his his being outspoken. So at some point, he he was no longer their superior. He was then 63 years of age. That would have been around 1969 or so, 68 or 69. He was no longer the superior of the Holy Ghost Fathers, and his intent was to retire mm. as uh, as now Archbishop, so he would be Archbishop Emeritus. Um, a group of seminarians didn't give him that opportunity. <laughs> so they, they came to him and said, uh, Excellency, we have a problem. The seminary training we're receiving is is not what it ought to be. Long story short, they prevailed upon him to found a seminary, gave him, uh, some some folks in Switzerland gave him what had been, no kidding, this is, this is amazing, um, gave him what had been um, the kennels of, <laughs> of a, a group of monks who trained St. Bernard's oh, wow. in, in the Swiss <laughs> Alps. Uh, so they were no longer doing that. And so this building, which had been the kennel, because the kennels and, and the monastery of these monks who trained St. Bernard's to rescue people in the Alps, was given by the layman who then owned it to Marcel Lefebvre to, to create the seminary. Hmm. He then, in 1970, in November, if I'm not mistaken, in November, uh, founded this society of St. Pius X, the priestly fraternity of St. Pius X, the purpose of which was simply to train men traditionally, to say the traditional Mass, to understand uh, church teaching through a traditional lens. Mm -hmm. In other words, to remain Catholic, notwithstanding all that was going on around him. There's no question, no one questions the legitimacy of the founding of this priestly fraternity of St. Pius X. It is argued what it was founded of as exactly. Was it a pious union or is it founded as some other ecclesiastical entity? Mm -hmm. In 1975, the bishop that had authorized, so his bishop who had authorized the the founding of the society, uh, had was replaced in natural order of things, and the new bishop uh, essentially um, suspended them. And so, so it, we, and so it began. And so it began. Before you go, real quick, why do, why would you say he chose uh, Saint Pius the Tenth? Simply because um, 
Pius X wrote an encyclical, Pascendi, against the modernists. And um, his insights into modernism and the havoc that that would wreck in the church were very prescient. Um, and Pius X was pope in what years? Do you uh, remember? 1903 he okay. became pope. So um, <clears throat> right before Marcel <clears throat> was born, as it turns <clears throat> out. By the time Marcel <laughs> – this is a funny story, right? But Marcel Lefebvre – Grew up in in traditional France, and and by the time he went to the seminary in Rome, he thought he was pretty well um, inoculated against modernism. But uh, mm. but uh, the rector of the seminary, when he got there, he said, "The first thing I'm going to have to do with you, Marcel Lefebvre, is I'm going to have to undo your liberalism," which is kind of, <laughs> which is kind of funny to think wow. about. But he said he was he actually needed to get straightened out. Mm on some liberal tenets such as separation of church and state. And so he said he had to, he had to have a lot of this undone. Hmm. He chose Pius X as the name of this, of this priestly fraternity because he saw that the problems in the church and the problems that had corrupted the results of the Second Vatican Council were attributable to modernism. Hmm. And so he founded it to resist the zeitgeist, the onslaught of modernism within the church. And if it would be denies that modernism hasn't infected the church, they're not paying attention. Yeah. So that's why. Well, we're coming up on a, uh, on a <clears throat> quick break. But before we go, I want to uh, I want to read out a quote here by our, uh, Archbishop Marcel uh, Lefebvre. This is from uh, his book, Open Letter to Confused Catholics. Uh, very good read. This is why I persist. And if you wish to know the real reason for my persistence, it is this. At the hour of my death, when our Lord asks me, what have you done with your episcopate? What have you done with your episcopal and priestly grace? I do not want to hear from the lips the terrible words, you have helped to destroy the church along with the rest of them. Very powerful words there, and we'll be right back. This is Jason Murphy for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas and the Obligation Radio Show here on the Carolina Catholic Media Network. Catholic Radio is live and on the air at AM 1270, broadcasting from Belmont, North Carolina to the Charlotte Regional Area. Carolina Catholic produces more local content than most Catholic radio stations across our country. Tune in on air, online, on demand, and anytime at www.carolinacatholic.com. Org. Make sure to catch the 2022 Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas replays each Saturday afternoon starting at 3 p.m. You can catch Keith Nestor, Tim Staples, Dr. Ray Garundi, our own Dr. John Aquaviva, and find out what the buzz is all about for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas. Also make sure to tune in to the featured men's shows on Carolina Catholic, Faith and Sport with Dr. John Aquaviva, airing on Mondays at 5 p.m. and on demand, The Remnant with Stephen Thomas, Bill Snyder, and Ray Haywood, airing on Saturdays at 5, and my show, The Obligation, which airs at 5 p.m. on Fridays. Catch all of these shows and more at AM 1270, on air, online, and over the app at www.carolinacatholic.org. Once again, this has been Jason Murphy. God bless and Esto Veer. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Hey everybody, my name's Bill Snyder. I'm one of the hosts of The Remnant, along with my good friends, Stephen Thomas and Ray Haywood. And we are so very blessed to be able to broadcast this hard-hitting men's show on the Carolina Catholic Media Network every single Saturday at 5 o'clock p.m. This show offers perspective from three different generations of men, and we tackle tough topics. But the amazing thing is, while we're hard-hitting, we never leave you angry and always hungry for more. So I hope you listen to us. You can tune in in a variety of ways on air at 1270 a.m. 
in the Charlotte area. You can also follow, friend, and like us on social media. You'll be able to find our social media channels available to you by searching for Carolina Catholic Media Network. There's also a wonderful app on both the Apple and Google Play stores. You are able to download it. Just search for Carolina Catholic Media Network, and you will find us and our podcasted versions of the show right there in the app. We hope you tune in, and as we always say, may God bless you and your families. And we are back. Welcome back to The Obligation, sitting down once again with my good friend Jim DiPiante. We've been talking about uh, the traditional Latin Mass, the Society of St. Pius X, and uh, most recently we're talking about Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, the Archbishop we presented as this rogue, as this uh, wild man out to just <laughs> disrupt <laughs> unity. Um, but I think there's nothing further than the truth, right? I mean, he uh, was yeah. he was retired— and approached by a group of seminarians, uh, legally founded the Society of St. Pius X um, under his you know, current bishop, and then that bishop moved on, and um, the next bishop's— His, his, his successor suspended Suspended that. it. Yeah, interesting. I, I, actually, the, the, whole, the whole business of the suspension is, is very, very troubling, because what was, who was suspended exactly, him personally, the order? It's not clear— and who had the authority to suspend? Was it his own bishop, or was it reserved to Rome? And his appeals essentially went unanswered. Hmm. Sounds um, very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very, very familiar to what we're going through right now today, for sure. Yeah. But, the, but the idea that I, I remember when all of this was playing out, and of course I lived through this, and I remember every time his name showed up on the news, it was, I, I, I joked, I said, what is, so we, we have cardinal archbishops, and, and then we have rebel archbishops. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's right. um, why, why rebel? This man didn't have a rebellious bone in his body. He was a gentle soul, a very gentle soul. He wasn't rebelling. He was holding fast yes. to, to tradition. I've got another great quote here by him. Um, I accept the Rome of all time with its doctrine and with its faith. That is the Rome we are following. But the modernist Rome, which is changing religion, I refuse it and I reject it. And that is the Rome which was introduced into the council and which is in the process of destroying the church. I refuse that church. I think a lot of Catholics are there. I think a lot of Catholics are, are there today, especially, you know, your, your traditional Latin Mass followers, even even groups, many groups of, of faithful Novus Ordo Catholics. You know, they're seeing through the smoke and the mirrors. They're seeing through um, the many changes and abuses. That, <laughs> they're seeing that the spring, the, the new yeah. springtime. Spring has sprung. <laughs> and it has didn't sprung. sprung right? It sprung <laughs> the wrong way. It sprung yeah. down. So, you know— um, so I'm glad, you know, to hear a little bit about, you know, the history of the Society of St. Pius X and how it was founded, because it was founded legally um, by a, a good and holy man seeking only the betterment and to adhere to the church as as he knew it, as we knew it, as Catholics knew it for, you know, well over a thousand years. Um, and, you know, I guess the reason for this founding, you know, let's let's talk about it. You know, we've talked about a lot of things. We're going to continue to talk about it. There's a, there's a ton of things to talk about. Um, you know, but when you really get into what was changed, you know, the, the, the prayers of the Mass were changed. Um, if you look specifically at the prayers during the Mass, the traditional Latin Mass contains uh, just about twice as many prayers as the Novus Ordo Mass. Uh, there's certainly uh, a lot more scripture included in the traditional Latin Mass. And there's, uh, you know, many, many, many uh, more acts of reverence and gestures by the priest to show the reverence to to the Blessed Sacrament and to our Lord and his sacrifice. So, um, you know, that being said, with some of the prayers that have changed, um, there's a pretty big one there, the pro multis pro vobis. Um, you know, Jim, you know, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a real problem. Um, so, so rendered in English, it's um, we're speaking, of course, of the words at the consecration of the blood, where after he says, "This is the this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting testament. It will be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins." That was pro multis, pro multis. in the Latin, arbitrarily. 
No, maybe not arbitrary. <laughs> maybe very deliberately, those words were changed to for all men. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is at that point, what is being referred to are those who avail themselves of the grace of our Lord's sacrifice. The idea of saying for all rather than for many had already been condemned in the church. And so if you look at, at, at writings previous, there, there is a reason why we don't say for all at that particular point. So yes, Christ died for all men, but all men do not avail themselves of that saving grace. Right. So why was it changed? Well, it conforms absolutely to this really cool idea of universal salvation. Ecumenism. And ecumenism. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a long time, there was a really, a really serious question as to whether or not this invalidates the consecration. And it's not just it's not just crazy talk. Now, why was it changed? And then why was it changed back? Hmm. Pope Benedict, God bless him, but he saw that this was problematic. Two thousand six, and he yeah. he changed it back, mm -hmm. uh, which was a tremendous relief for, for whatever else can be said that's wrong with the uh, the Novus Ordo Mise. At least that was fixed. At least it gave us a higher degree of confidence. It was not unreasonable to doubt the validity of the consecration. And if we don't have a valid consecration, we don't have a valid sacrifice. If we don't have a valid sacrifice, stay on and watch a football game on mm. Sunday. I mean, this is a waste of time. It's right. worse. It's a blasphemy. It's a sacrilege. So at least that's been rectified. Yes. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, yeah, so the, the, the missile, the Roman missile, I guess the third edition, late 2011, the shift from for all to for many could be misunderstood as some sort of narrowing of the scope of Jesus' salvic, salvific uh, action, right, like you mentioned. Um, so what is happening to this text in other languages? Because that, that was a, you know, a big question as well. My understanding is that um, in, a, in a very few languages it was rendered, it was never rendered incorrectly. Um, but I do know, certainly, in, in uh, some countries or some diocese within some countries, even though it's supposed to say now for many, as it's rendered in the vernacular, it's still rendered the equivalent of for all. Okay. So even notwithstanding that it's been fixed um, in the broad, <clears throat> in implementation, it's still not been fixed universally. Absolutely right. not. So, you know, so changes to prayers, that's, that's just, that's one. We could, you know, we could, we could have a whole show. We could have a whole, several shows on, on the prayer specifically. Uh, but that, I mean, obviously when you're, when you're, when you're affecting the, um, the consecration of the Blessed Sacrament, like you said. You're it, touching on the, the heart of the faith. the heart. That's it. So that, that obviously is, the, you know, the, the most important um, item that, you know, to discuss regarding you know, the change of the prayers. Just a, just a real quick observation. Yeah. If you look at every single <clears throat> change every single change there's a there's a correspondence mm. between the change and the modernist agenda yes yeah and it and it, and it keeps resurfacing you know <laughs> it won't the die it won't the, dead, go away. the dead fish keeps floating to the top <laughs> you know and uh and it keeps coming to surface um you know I'm looking, you know, I've been looking, thinking about, you know, all the changes. Uh, there, there's a couple we're going to talk about today. Obviously, communion in the hand, that's a big one. Uh, yeah. But bef before we get there, because that, that's a pretty big one, um, you know, when I think about all the changes, the changes to the prayers, the changes to the mass, the changes to the language, it seems like even if you change all those things, but you didn't change the calendar, um, at least you would have continuity there with the feasts and uh, what has been practiced for you know over a thousand years. But even the calendar was was wrecked. Why you know, feasts were completely <laughs> Why? removed, arbitrarily removed, 
or or changed. It makes no sense. It severs everything from our past. Then I mean, every, you know, the other changes. Okay, I can you know I can if I can try to put my head around and say, okay, well they want to be more ecumenical. They want to bring you know the Protestant brothers in. They want it to be more welcoming. And and some of the things may have been too solemn and and too. Um, uh, ceremonious, you know, or, you know, to, to, to those who are Protestant. Okay, good. I, I, I can, I can kind of ride with you there, but when you sever yourself from everything historical, that's where I'm, I'm like, it's, it's clear. It is very clear. They were trying to establish a new, well, a new liturgy. You know, um, when, so why, why do we celebrate a saint's feast on a particular day? And the answer is very simple. What we're celebrating is their birthday. Not the day they were born into this life, mm. but the day they were born into eternal life. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions because if a, if a feast happens, if some, some poor fellow happened to die on December 25th, he's not going to get his feast day right. on Christmas Day. Right. Although there is a saint, as the name the saint escapes me, but there is a saint whose actual feast day is December 25th, and it's always just neglected. Poor fellow. Yeah. <laughs> but... Just, just pick one. St. Thomas Aquinas, March 7th. I know that. Why would I know that? I know that because I know that. But that's not when it is anymore. Mm. And so when does poor Tom get to celebrate his feast day? Right. My name's Tom, and I want to have a, a name day for my saint. It used to be March 7th. Right. Now it's whatever else it is. I well, even priestly a- ordinations <clears throat> for... For so long, we're we're on the feast of uh, Saint Peter and Saint Paul. Saint Peter and Paul, right? And right. even that's on a different day now, right? Oh no, I don't know. I don't know. I, I hope it's not. I hope. I, I hope not. But I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think the ordination dates align. No, uh, no, that's they don't align. Right. Yeah. Um, so the the whole thing. I mean, if you look at all of the, um, if you just list all of the saints on the calendar, previous to the change, and now, the vast majority have been changed. Certain of them have been dropped. Hmm. And it's, and there's no clear rationale as to why. Uh, but let's just I mean, Occam's razor. Like, what is an explanation that makes sense and explains all the phenomenon? It does succeed absolutely in diminishing respect for the canon of saints. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, because we don't even know when their feast days are anymore. We don't celebrate them. Yeah, they're they're celebrated, quote unquote, in the mass, but we don't. Have, well, I, I, I will tell you, two remain unchanged: Saint Valentine <laughs> and Saint Patrick. There you go. Of course, of course, <laughs> big time celebration. I mean, so those are obviously <clears throat> important, uh, but it, you know, even further, uh, the readings, the readings don't align. They don't align. And that is not Catholic. No, it's not. It's, it's even worse than that because traditionally the church selected readings, two, an epistle and a gospel. So from the, generally from the letters and then from uh, – or the Acts and then uh, from the gospels, the four gospels. Two readings, the ones that were most important to experience then – and that's on the Sundays. Then we have readings during the week, but if there's no feast day assigned, then you simply repeat the readings from the previous Sunday. Now we have this, and, and by the way, that was a cycle that repeated annually, mm. and it was very, very closely tied to how we live out our lives through the year. Now we have this Looney Tunes three-year cycle, which is impossible to keep up with, but the idea is we're going to hear more scripture. The Catholic faith is not taught by hearing scripture it's taught by hearing the church tell us about scripture Mm. not just reading it to us yes so it's essentially a protestant idea that we just (laughs) right we just have to listen Mm. listen we just all listen to the bible and we're going to figure all this out no the catholic faith is in the catechism not scripture yes the church teaches us based on what's scripture but it teaches us through the catechism and through homilies, not directly through scripture. That's a Protestant notion. But the whole new milieu is all about let's let's essentially read the better part of the Bible by going to Sunday Mass and having two readings from the, uh, the epistles and one from the gospel, and then doing that essentially differently over a three-year period. Yeah. So nothing aligns. That's nothing right. aligns. Yeah, very difficult to follow. Um, that's the that's the, that's one I, I just I can't I can't get my head around. Um, 
you know, such a disconnect, the change of the feast, the change of the readings, you know, I, I, the other things, like I said, I can, okay, I can, I can kind of go along, you know, for a second at there, least, but once least, you slice and dice it. Some, some sense to it, but no, no, there's, no. The only, the only way you can, you can rationalize it is if you assume a nefarious motive. Well, speaking of nefarious motives, um, let's just do a quick uh, overview of the Reformation. So uh, very similar things took place in the Reformation. Uh, the vernacular put in place of the Latin um, communion, you know, offered under different species, you know, uh, leavened bread, perhaps, mm -hmm. in the hand. Um, uh, Kramer, Kramer was adamant. This is not an altar. It's a table. I right. Mean, uh, but, but folks who've been in the traditional game for some time refer to these but ugly tables that you see mm -hmm. in front of these great altars. <laughs> we call them Kramer tables mm -hmm. because Kramer was – that was his – one of the most important tenets of his, of his heresies was this cannot be an altar of sacrifice. It is a table of a communal meal. And the, all, the, the mass was not a sacrifice. It was not a representation of Calvary. It was – a reenactment, a commemoration mm -hmm. of the Last Supper. This squares exactly with the so-called theology of the New Mass. Well, we are coming up on another break. Thanks for tuning in to The Obligation, and we will be right back. Did you know that 90% of older adults wish to stay in their home as they age? Aging in place has many benefits. It tends to improve quality of life, which in return improves physical health. Also, retaining independence as we age is critically important to our mental health. Hi, my name is Meredith Stignan, and I am the president of Harmony Home Solutions and an active parishioner of St. Patrick Cathedral. We are your trusted partner for aging in place. We strive to enhance the lives of older adults and their families by providing premier aging in place and universal design lifestyle solutions that increase safety beautifully. Now is the time to get your aging in place plan in order with Harmony Home Solutions. Visit our website today at hhsclt.com. Again, that's hhsclt.com. Or give us a call at 980-220-8821. Again, that's 980-220-8821. We want to help you live an empowered and beautiful life. Twenty twenty two is bringing many new and exciting changes to our Carolina Catholic Apostolate, built to communicate how to better learn, love, and live our Catholic faith. We begin with our name change to Carolina Catholic Media. This reflects the expanded scope of Carolina Catholic Radio to include the development of our podcast, streaming, social media, YouTube, and direct marketing platforms. 2022 is a very important year for the Catholic Church. As a result, Carolina Catholic Media will feature more local news, information, and conversation to reflect what's happening now and how it impacts our local Catholic community. Throughout the year, Carolina Catholic Media will showcase our Catholic schools and homeschools, the Charlotte Diocese 50th anniversary, and the two-year worldwide synod process that begins on the diocesan level. We encourage you to get involved, join us, and catch the spirit. The Carolina Catholic Media Apostolate is a 501c3 nonprofit. We are 100% funded by you. Please consider a donation, monthly tithe, or business sponsorship to support our mission and vision to spread the truth of Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith across the Carolinas. Thank you for discerning a role in our apostolate. May God bless you abundantly. And we are back. Thanks for tuning in to The Obligation. Sitting down once again. Jim DiPiante here in the Carolina Catholic Media Network studio on North Tryon in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I've just been covering uh, some of the changes to the Mass, changes to the calendar, changes to the readings, um, changes to everything. Um, communion in the hand, that's a, that's, a, that's a big one that the traditional followers, and obviously, you know, it should be, um, with the respect and the reverence given to the Blessed Sacrament. Um, but that was, a, that, was early, that was seen early on by Paul VI, 
as a, yeah. as a problem. As a big yeah, problem. He opposed yeah, he it. recognized yeah. that. Um, he even, you know, issued a document, Memoriale Domini, uh, which was in 1969. So just on the cusps, you know, coming off the cusp of just, the, just just after, just after, the, uh, um, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, there were there were things going on. There was implementation and abuses already taking place with the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and there's just you know, a few lines here. Uh, he says, indeed, in certain communities and in certain places, this practice has been introduced without prior approval having been requested of the Holy See, and at times without any attempt to prepare the faithful adequately. Um, it also is true that in very ancient times they were allowed to take the Blessed Sacrament with them from the place where the Holy Sacrifice was celebrated, and this was principally so they would be able to give uh, themselves viaticum in the case they had to face death for their family, sure. for their faith. <laughs> this was, this was so, like, little different, you know. Different. I don't think any Look, of the us— the church is not stupid. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, this is amusing. So, yeah, the church made provisions for people to actually touch the Blessed Sacrament. Right. But you know what? Actually ensh- enshrined in uh, the 1917 Code of Canon Law— Actually, it was it was apparently a real problem. So, if if the priest should drop the host and it should fall onto a woman's, mm. where it would have been inappropriate for the priest to retrieve it, it was actually permitted for the priest mm. to indicate to the woman that she should yes. then take the blessed sacrament and consume it herself without his intervention. And it was very clear they did not then have to do an ablution. <laughs> Well, that's a true story that happened to my mom one day at Mass. And she looked down, and the priest looked down, and he very politely said, please pick up the host. <laughs> and she was mortified, and he was mortified. But, but it was actually anticipated on why. Yeah. Look, the church yeah. is not stupid, and the church has lived a big slice of life. Yeah. And so they're, she's very practical. So to point to the fact that the early Christians. Look, just to be clear, the early Christians also got eaten by lions. Yeah, so if you yeah. want to be like the early right. Christian, are you ready to be eaten by Breast lions? cut off, you know, right. not right. just the right. Blessed right. Sacrament falling on Saint Agatha, yeah. right, yeah. Saint Agatha in, That's right. in Sicily. That's right. So it's specious at best to say, well, the early Christians did this, so we should. First off, that's an invalid argument right off the bat, but they did it for a very different reason. Yeah. They, they did it to have the possibility to communicate if they should then be martyred. Mm-hmm. That's right. Okay, I'm good with that. Right. We, we can do that yep. if we limit ourselves to that. So uh, LifeSite News featured um, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, I said it right, mm-hmm. um, back in 2020, and this was to debunk, the myth, debunk myths um, around communion in the hands. Uh, based well, on that was that was because we had the bishops. Uh, well, this this whole I mean, our bishops, God help them, uh, with uh, with the pandemic and yes. people concerned about the possibility of spreading spreading disease. That's right. Uh, yeah, you know, um, it seemed in his point, you know, that some of the bishops, you know, were placing the physical, you know, health of of, of folks, you know, ahead of that of the spiritual um, health, and. Um, you know, by no communion on the tongue, um, canceling mass, um, you know, stating that, you know, groceries were essential, but the mass was not. And uh, we know that there are stories of saints who lived only on the Blessed Sacrament, so uh, that could be debated there. Um, but in regards to the argument about communion in the hands, and folks may say, oh, well, the church did it before. Well, the church did do it in early, early times, um, only under very, you know, very strict circumstances. And it wasn't done, you know, where, where um, these days it's, it's, it's um, instructed that the left hand would be over the right hand, and then you would take it with the right hand and, and consume. Uh, the right hand would have been over the, I'm sorry, the right hand would have been over the left, and then there would have been a very profound bow. And uh, like some of the Orthodox churches, you would bend down to it. You wouldn't lift the host up to yourself. You know, you would bow down to the host, and then you would you would consume it uh, by uh, licking it. You know, putting your tongue directly on it, and then you would lick your hands. Um, and it wasn't casual. It wasn't just kind of casual where one hand's in the pocket and one hand's <laughs> out, or one hand's holding the baby and just you know uh, you know it was it was very it was very strict. Um, 
and and it was changed quickly. Uh, but to, but to reintroduce it, you know, with Vatican II and and what came along with that, you know, that goes contrary to at least a thousand years of tradition of communion in the tongue on the tongue. Um, of course, there's uh, you know you have the issue of particles being lost if the host is dropped. Um, and I mean, I, I know I've, I've heard stories where, you know, you cut the carpet, the priest would come and cut the carpet sure. out, yep. um, yep. if a proper ablution couldn't be done, you know, where it was dropped. Um, and again, and, and in above that, um, the priest's hands are consecrated. The faithful's hands are not consecrated. Um, and that's, that's another thing. So, um, you know, the communion in the hands, you know, that, that, that argument can, you know, can, can be defeated with, you know, showing a thousand years of continuity of it not being. Um, I, I one time was training altar boys and, um, you know, trying to show them how to use the patent, which, of course, is the, the little plate there that the altar boy would hold under uh, the chin of the communicant or under their hands if it's in the Novus Ordo. And so that they could better understand, we did a little science test, and I took one of the wafers, obviously not consecrated, and I dropped it on the counter, and I said, you know, I picked up the wafer, and I showed them. I said, what do you see on there? You see little particles. I said, well, you know, if this was a consecrated host, that would be our Lord. And if that was done on the floor, then you can imagine, you know, our Lord is there, and he'd be, you know, walked on and disrespected. Or if it was in the hand and you stuck in your pocket or you gave Joe a high five after mass, our Lord is just, you know, kind of not being very reverently attended to. Um, and so they un- they understood that because they could see it. I mean, it's one thing to talk about it, but when you actually take that, Experience if you take a, Ritz, it, right? you take a Ritz cracker it. and you drop it on your counter, you're going to have crumbs. You know, and every part of that crumb is the is same. The body, blood, soul, and divinity. Just like every part of the crumb is, is is still a Ritz cracker. It's still mm. part of the Ritz cracker. It still has all the elements of the Ritz cracker. <laughs> and interestingly, in a physical, not even a spiritually speaking. So right, and, and, and interestingly, in fact, particles actually persist as being the Blessed Sacrament long past yeah. the host that we consume. That's because right. generally, the Church has said. 10, 15 minutes, it ceases to be what it was. It's no longer – now Now it's a part of us physically. Right. So that, that bread now ceases to be bread, and so it ceases to be also the, the body of Christ. Whereas any particles that happen to fall, um, yeah. they remain. Uh, I, had one, I once had a priest, right. um, Father Tom Scott. You may have heard. I do. <laughs> uh, he genuflected to me after Mass. I served Mass for him, and he was always joking. But, I mean, he was he was being serious, yet he was joking, acknowledging the fact that, you know, I had just consumed our Lord as well. And he genuflected to me before he left the sacristy that day. That's, that's beautiful. That was, that was a beautiful actually. kind of image, is, right? Is, yeah. Just acknowledging Christ in me as, sure. I, you know, as we acknowledged uh, that our Lord was there on the altar and we consumed him. So kind of, you know, made an impression on me, you know, made me think a little further that, yeah, you know, especially, you know, we, we receive at church and of course we fight our way out of the parking lots or whatever may be uh, to remember that. As, our Lord. as now tabernacles. That's right. That's right. We go out. Um, so, you know, really real quick back to this, this document from um, Paul the VI. Paul the VI, yeah. So he says, uh, this method, this method of distributing Holy Communion must be retained, speaking of on the tongue, on the tongue yeah. taking the present situation of the church in the entire world into account, not merely because it has many centuries of tradition behind it, but especially because it expresses the faithful's reverence for the Eucharist. Further, the practice which must be considered traditional ensures most effectively that the Holy Communion is distributed with the proper respect, decorum, and dignity. It removes the danger of profanation of the sacred species in which, in a unique way, Christ, God and man, is present whole and entire, substantially and continually. Lastly, it ensures that diligent carefulness about the fragments of consecrated bread which the church has always recommended. What you have allowed to drop, think of it as though you had lost one of your own members. So those are very, very strong, very strong words, words of yeah. Paul the Sixth, who uh, you know was responsible for the the Second Vatican Council, but already in 1969 recognizing that. And then the last point on that is, um, with that letter, he sent out uh, questions to uh, to his bishops, and uh, there are uh, two questions here that I'll read. Uh, the first was, do you think that attention should be paid? to the desire that over and above the traditional manner, the right of receiving Holy Communion on the hand should be admitted. And overwhelmingly, uh, 597 said yes, and 1,233 said no. And then the second question, is it your wish that this new right be first tried in small communities with the consent of the bishop? 
Uh, that being said, you know, should it, should it be tried in, in communion of the hand uh, with the consent of the local bishop? Uh, 751 said yes, and 1,215 said no. So, um, so huge numbers, uh, uh, even, at, even with the bishops back then, showing that, um, you know, the communion should not be uh, and was not recommended in the, hand in the not, hands. And it's, not, it's an abuse. Be, sure. It's an abuse. And I don't know how and why it can continue to be done. Uh, well... If you if you believe if you truly believe that within contained within that wafer is the body blood soul and divinity of the same God who created the entire universe who sent his son to die for us whose son died for us to redeem us and the spirit of whom continues to sanctify us if you believe that who are you hmm. to presume to take that in your hands? Socially, culturally, we do things to recognize things that are important. So in the military, a man salutes the officer who must in turn salute the enlisted man. Mm -hmm. We do that as a, as a sign of their dignity, as a sign of their importance. If all of a sudden we stopped doing these, these, these reverences, these social, these cultural things that we do to acknowledge the importance of something, it is absolutely unfailingly true that what we believe about those things and the importance of those things will be radically diminished. Well, Back when all of this was going on, <clears throat> certain of us were saying this will diminish respect for and belief in the real presence. Let's say it again. The majority of people who call themselves Catholic do not believe that contained within that host is a body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 70%. It's, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. Well, <laughs> which came first? Reduce belief in the real presence or reduction in the, the dignity that we seek to revere in the real presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? I mean, that's really the crux of Catholic right there. I mean, that's it. I mean, that is, that is the yay or nay moment. Yep. Um, yep. A couple years ago, uh, it might have been two years ago, the Diocese of Charlotte, I guess it was the year of the Eucharist. Maybe St. Joseph was last year. I can't remember which mm -hmm. this year, but, um, you know, and they wanted to, you know, make sure, you know, Catholics, you know, studied the Eucharist, understood the Eucharist, you know, knew the importance of the Eucharist, believed, obviously, in the Eucharist. And in my humble layman's opinion, I thought the easiest way that you could turn over the you know, the apple cart and really, you know, push push what you're selling is to disallow communion in the hands it would t it would be a lot. You'd get a lot of kickback, uh, understandably. You'd, you'd have a lot of people that would not agree, a lot of people that would leave the church, but you would also have a lot of people who would recognize, wow, this is this something is, this different. Is, this different. This is, this is, is special, important. Right? That could have been without – aside from all the teaching that any catechesis – or class or RCIE class could could instruct if you just came in <laughs> one Sunday and said in this diocese we will not permit communion in the hands I know it's huge I know that's a big that's a big <laughs> deal I know, I'm an extreme guy I, I'm just saying no, that's a, that's a big deal but dope. how big is our dope. Lord how big of a deal is our Lord and, yeah. and and belief in him and knowing that our fellow Catholics uh, do believe when 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 everyone's receiving it doesn't matter what you say when everyone's receiving communion in the hand well your actions are screaming so loud that I can't hear what you are saying. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're doing, which is, it is irreverent, then it doesn't matter what you say. Well, we need to show greater reverence. We, yeah. need, to, we need to have greater belief in the, in the real presence. We need to, uh, uh, what you're doing. Well, <laughs> Lex Orandi, <laughs> Lex Credendi. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so these, uh, these things seem so simple. So straightforward, I guess we don't have the intellectual might to be able to deal to, to be able to fabricate the sophistries yes. that, that would 
<laughs> well, speaking of sophistries, today I call myself an armchair quarterback. How about that? <laughs> Sitting on the sofa of Catholicism here, talking about how we should and could do it. But uh, it's just my humble opinion. Um, you know, I guess we've all got our opinions, of course. But um, but that's a very simple, you know, way to instruct mm, yeah. and, and, and yeah. accomplish a lot. Um, I'm trying to think. I think we're we're coming up on time. Is Brant giving me the nod out there? How are we looking? Yeah, we're getting we're getting close. Uh, I guess that's enough controversy for today. We <laughs> I could probably dive into a couple more here, but uh, no, I think uh, I think we've we've made some good grounds. We've um, we've talked about Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, his history, you know how he was not the the wild man that uh, that many would like to make him out. He was trying to retire, you know, like. <laughs> A lot of guys out there just trying to lay back and, and lay low and not get back in the game. And uh, he was trying to retire and relax and, you know, live the rest of his saintly life. Um, but, you know, was called back in uh, by his seminarians and also by his duty as, as a Catholic. Oh, and then, then by the faithful. Yeah. The faithful clamored yeah. for him. We yeah. did. We did here in North Carolina. He came here. Yeah. He came here. So... Um, so we've talked about the changes, and, and we'll continue. There, there are certainly many, many, many more things that we, we've got questions about and, uh, and items that you know, are worth, worthy to discuss. So, Jimmy, thanks again, once again. My pleasure. Um, pleasure. We'll, we'll be back. We will be back. We're making good ground, and uh, until they shut us down and pull the plug, I think we'll be back. <laughs> we'll so, be back. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, God bless, and Esto Vir. If you enjoyed this episode and have any questions or comments or would like to come on the show and discuss your faith walk or any issue regarding the Catholic Church, send us an email at feedback at theobligationshow.com. You can also catch all of our previous episodes and all of the shows of Carolina Catholic Media at www.carolinacatholic.org. Click that donate button and we'd greatly appreciate it. There are also many opportunities to sponsor the show, the radio station, and the Catholic Men's Conference. Join Census Fidelium, Harmony Home Solutions, and Wallach Investments, who have pledged their funds to help keep Catholic radio on the air and relevant. Census Fidelium is a collection of Catholic homilies, apologetic videos, and other resources to grow in one true faith. They can be found online at www.sensusfidelium.com. Wallach Investment LLC is a strategic moral investing firm committed to placing their clients' interest ahead of their own. Their mission is to be a force of good in their relationships to make the most of their clients' investment, giving them the time and confidence to pursue their mission. Contact Daniel Wallach at www.wallachinvestments.com for more information. For the Obligation Radio Show, the Catholic Men's Comments of the Carolinas, and the Carolina Media Network, my name is Jason Murphy. God bless and esto vivo.